need you to get on your feet. It's about to go down. Come on, get on your feet. Obedience. <laughs> How many of us have been told to do something by God, but because it put us in a peculiar position or it made us vulnerable, we didn't do it because we were trying to protect some of our own flipping integrity that we thought we built up. But God is putting you in that position because he's trying to prove that you trust him. The reason why some of us get bombarded by the devil so much it's because he don't fear that we trust God. As a matter of fact, the devil for some of us knows that we've given him more credit than we give God credit. Because rather than living with a life of trustworthiness toward God, we live a life of fear toward our enemy. So God is saying, you've got some weapons. But not just those weapons, you've got the weapon of faith. Faith says that when you've got it, you can please God. So God has given us this law, and it's called stand your ground. It means that you never have to take a whooping ever again. And though man might use it in a perverted manner, God has given it over to the church that no matter what comes your way, you not only have some offensive weapons, but you've got on the whole armor of God. How many of you know that it's dangerous to leave your house without your armory on? I don't know about you, but there are times right when I come out of prayer and feel my most powerful that it's there I seem to be my most vulnerable because right while I got my hands up in worship it feel, feels like I'm taking two or three punches to the gut I can't even get my worship over I can't even get my praise fulfilled before it seems like the enemy's doing something to try to turn me back from God but tell your neighbor press on anyway press on Anyway, come on, you got press in hair and press on nails. You might as well have some press in worship. You might as well go on a little further. You might as well allow God to get out of you what he desires from you because it's in your times of trepidation that proves your allegiance to God. You know, everybody can do church well when things going well. But do you praise him when the job is over? Do you praise him when the car is gone? Do you praise him when the house is foreclosed? Do you praise him when folk walk away from you? Do you praise him when stuff fall through? Do you praise him when people betray you? Do you praise him when folk abandon you? Do you praise him when your plans don't work out? Do you praise him when they cancel your engagement? Y'all ain't gonna help me. Can you praise him in the midst of the hell that you going through or are you just a good uh, sunny day Christian when everything is alright you got that old pity pet praise but I need some snot slingers in the house huh, that know how to praise God huh, when all hell done broke loose huh, when it looked like you ought to lose your mind huh, slap three people tell them sling some snot up in here learn how to praise God when the devil has done everything he could to try to break you down Somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah, I'm talking about people who understand that God does his best work when your back is up against the wall. And you know it's funny because the reason why so many people are struggling with the power of God is because through their own liberated existence of relativism, have abandoned objective truth. I was interviewed the other day and the lady asked me, why does it seem like we have so much problems or so many problems amongst people and racist and ethnicity? And I said, because we're trying to live life out of our own culture and experiences. If we would use one mode of objective truth, then it would gauge all of our actions. It wouldn't matter if we was African or Arab or Italian. Once we read what the word of God says, it tells us how we're 
supposed to respond to one another. The reason we've got so much trouble and so many situations where it looks like racial profiling and injustice among uh, different denominations of people and different denominations of existence is because we don't have one objective truth. Everybody's tried to figure out how to do what they want to do. It's even prevalent in the church. We can't even agree on Acts 236 through 238. We can't even agree on how you ought to baptize folk. We can't even agree on what real salvation is. We can't even agree on what it means to speak in tongues. These are all essential elements of power and salvation. And the enemy has taught us how to divide one another so that he can conquer us individually. It's hard to get 400 people in the potter's house dating to act the same way at the same time. How in the world can I have five people over here slapping and clapping and jumping and running and I got three people over here sitting like they ain't heard nothing and the same word going forth. Something wrong with somebody. It's because the enemy, even in our own presumptuous spirituality has given us our own relative thought about God and how we feel about him. And some people spend more energy trying not to be like everybody else that you ain't being like nobody. You have not proved your own individuality. You've only displayed your own stupidity. Because when it's time to give God some praise, when it's time to bless the Lord, you ought to have some expression. Ain't no way in the world you can be in the midst and the atmosphere of God moving and healing and bringing manifestation and seeing brothers come to the altar and give their life back to God. Seeing women healed and delivered and made free and you sit there like God ain't even in the house. I remember back in the day, every now and then I show up to a house and everybody would sit up because <laughs> they knew I had something with me. And I remember one time walking in the house and everybody came to the front because they knew once I got in, I'm about 10 minutes and then I'm out. And somebody was in the back and they said, you better come on. They was like, well, he ain't nobody. And I heard them say, you don't know who that is. But that's the one we've been waiting on. <laughs> you better hurry up and get it for it's gone. Uh, the problem with some people in the church, uh, you so disconnected from God uh, that when the spirit comes in the house uh, and he got something with him, uh, you so disconnected, you still in the back act uh, because you don't even know who he is. Slap somebody and say, this is the one we've been waiting on. God's come to deliver. He's come to set free. And you're still waiting on something. Huh? you just like the Messianic Jews. Huh? You're looking for God, but he done been here and left. Huh? You're looking for the Messiah, but he done showed up and left. Huh? You need to make sure that you grab hold of the truth. Tell somebody, I want the truth. I want God is saying because We've abandoned objective truth. Not only in the world, but in the church. It's being rejected. And we're rejecting truth so that lifestyles can be justified. So that worldviews can be acceptable. So that religious and lethargic and compromising mindsets can continue to be tolerated. See, we want to act a certain way and we want to find a reason to say it's okay. Because, see, you know, sometimes we, it's harder to let God change you than to just keep being the fool that we've been. And see, the scary thing about change is that it puts you in unfamiliar territory. But slap somebody and say, I need some unfamiliar in my life. I need some, uh, I need some unfamiliar in my life. I can't always hang with Pookie and Ray Ray Nim. 
I can't always be around Shalishka and the rest of them. Every now and then, I got to be around somebody who's naming the name of the Lord. Every now and then, with my crazy, freaky self, I need to be around some square folk that's green and don't know nothing. I need to hang around with a few church boys and church girls, folk whose dresses is still swinging in the dirt. Don't put on no earrings or makeup. I know that's religious, but every now and then I need to get away from the people that I've always been comfortable around unless I will never change. Need to be challenged where I'm comfortable. That's why in Deuteronomy 32 the Bible says that God is like an eagle that stirreth up his nest. We become nest minded. All we want to do is come to church and we think that's enough. We forgot that coming to church is supposed to help us be the church. Something that we're coming in is supposed to get in us. And when we leave, we're supposed to take what got in us out there. And we're supposed to make sure that the folk that don't come in the pews begin to smell the sweet savor of the living God. That we take something out there that's an aroma that's so attractive that it begins to draw people into the house of God that has always despised the house of God. But it ain't the house of God that they're coming to. They're coming to whatever changed you because they knew how crazy and kinky you was on the other side. But if it got you changed, it must be real. God is trying to use us in a peculiar way in these times. This is a time of demonstration. Don't you see it? Started with Egypt and all over the world. They began to demonstrate. God is calling the church to demonstration. And he's using the world as the platform for his voice because he won't listen to him in worship because all we want is our selfish healing. We don't want to get healed so we can go to the hospital and lay hands. We just want to get healed so we can go back to doing what we was. But God is saying, I'm looking for demonstrators. I'm looking for people who will march. Not just on Martin Luther King Day, but you'll march every day. And you'll make it your life goal that people understand that there's a mission and a mandate for the invisible church where we feed the hungry, clothe the naked. We visit the nursing homes and the rehab centers and the hospitals. We do what we gotta do to get the gospel out. Somebody say spread the good news. Spread. It ain't just about coming in here like a lump of mayonnaise in the middle of the bread. It's about being a knife where God can use you to spread the gospel to the other most part of the world to get you on the whole part of the loaf of bread. Tell somebody the whole bread. God's trying to get us into places where the church visible can't go. I need you to get on your feet. It's about to go down. Come on, get on your feet. <laughs>